Uh, thanks to Steve Wickham and Ray Cohen there for a wonderful uh, introduction to this evening's event. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of Cyber County Council to welcome you here this evening. For the first, since February 2020, would you believe, in front of a live audience for the world. It has been a long wait and we're delighted that you're back with us. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our online audience who have stayed with us since March 2020. So a big welcome to you and hopefully you'll stay with us again. And I'd like to take this opportunity to recognise and to put on record and to thank Patricia King, Lou McGrath, Michelle Brennan from, and Michelle Brennan from Saigo Library Service, along with Una Mannion, Alice Lyons and Keith Hopper of IT Sligo for their unstinting devotion to this word and their programming of excellent evenings of entertainment and discussion. Um, it is also apt, I'd say, to recognise our partners' recognition for their endeavour over the decades who have now been made into a university, which congratulations to IT Sligo on becoming Atlantic TU. We look forward to working with you. <laughs> This evening is an opportunity to welcome and introduce our recently appointed Decade of Centennial Writer-in-Residence, the renowned journalist and writer Susan McKay. Susan needs no introduction, and suffice to say we are delighted to have Susan lead out on a particular aspect of Sligo's Decade of Centenary commemorative programme, that of partition, a very difficult subject, and its effects on communities and the division of people and places. We look forward to Susan's work in the coming months and we are no doubt that Susan's engagement will be very fruitful. Fi finally, I wish to thank Susan's special guest tonight for taking time out from his very busy work schedule, a schedule that takes him around the globe reporting on major conflicts as they happen, a job that requires not only sheer bravery, but also copious amounts of empathy and the skill set of the storyteller such as we are witnessing the tragedies currently unfolding in the Ukraine and reported on by our guest tonight. It is indeed an honour to welcome Fergal King to Sligo and to this evening's episode of The Word. And I'd like again to welcome our musicians to this, uh, putting in an interlude of music throughout tonight's events as well. Before I hand over to Susan, may I point out our, our fire exits to the rear and to the front. And also, if you haven't done so by now, please switch off your mobile or place it on silent. Thank you very much, because this has been recorded. I wish to welcome onto the stage for tonight's event of the word, Susan McKay and Fergal Keane. Thank you. Fantastic to be here and uh, to know that you're all back after not being able to come out to live events for so long. It's, it's a particular pleasure to be in front of you tonight and to be introducing such a brilliant guest. Uh, just before I uh, introduce Fergal, I'm going to just say a little bit about the um, course that I'm going to be running, which this is the introduction to in a way. Um, the Decade of Centenaries is the, is the context, as Donal has mentioned. And from the 9th of April here in the libraries, in the library from 2 to 3 p.m., I'm going to be running a writing course for people who want to write about um, their own family's experience of partition or about Sligo's involvement in partition or about this region's involvement in partition. And I think it's going to be very interesting as well as very challenging because, of course, the big thing about partition is that a lot of people just don't talk about it and there aren't stories in people's families. And that's why it's really important that we're going to be talking to Fergal, who's such a brilliant person, to get stories. Um, so if you're interested in taking part in that, it's open to people who have writing experience and it's also open to people who don't have writing experience. And we're going to be having skills training as part of it as well. So you might not actually want to write, you might want to learn how to record interviews on your phone or just even talk about how to get people in your family to talk about your family histories. So it, it's very much uh, 
open to what people want to get from it and there'll be really interesting guests as, as we go along. So it's going to run for eight weeks from the 9th of um, April here in the library. But talk to Lou McGrath here if you want to put your name down for that because places will be quite limited because of the, the limited space that we have. Anyway, uh, now for the important part of the night, really, is to introduce our guest, Fergal Keane. Um, I didn't really think that we would be able to get Fergal, and uh, particularly when I spoke to one of his agents and they mentioned the sort of fee that he normally commands, but <laughs> which was quite honestly almost as much as I'm being paid for my entire uh, Never sojour talk to the agents. sojourn as a uh, writer in residence. But anyway, uh, when I contacted Fergal directly, he just immediately came back and said, I'd love to do it and he's doing it for us at nothing like the kind of expense that was, was mentioned, but I will never go directly to an agent again. That was a lesson learned. Um, so this, we're particularly going to be talking tonight about this book, Wounds, uh, which Fergal wrote in 2017, but of course, most of you will know Fergal as, you know, the esteemed journalist who writes and talks about, about wars and has written many books, but in particular has been on our screens in the last while because of his work in Ukraine. And, you know, you, I could talk for 20 minutes just listing the awards that Fergal has won for his work. He's won all of the important awards that journalists aspire to, to win, but that isn't actually what's most important about his work. What's important about his work has been advanced to by Donal. It's the fact that he has such incredible human empathy for the people that he's talking to and he treats people in situations where they are devastated with great respect and gets from them uh, stories that they don't care to tell to other journalists who don't approach them in that um, empathetic and kind and generous way. And I think that always what you feel from Fergal's reports is the immense compassion that he has for the people that he's interviewing. And uh, one of the reviews of this book, the, the book Wounds, uh, refers to um, his loathing of war and of all who celebrate the killing of their fellow men and women. And I think that's what comes through in, in all of the work that he does. So this book is called uh, Wounds, A Memoir of War and Love. And it's uh, his book about his own family and its involvement in the, the War of Independence and in that period. So it's going to be very relevant to anybody here who actually wants to take part in the course, as well as being of relevance just in terms of people thinking about these years as we go through the, the, this probably the most fraught period for the Republic uh, in terms of the decade of centenaries. So, um, Fergal, I'll just ask you to start off with Probably, I suppose, we should start by talking about Ukraine because that's what's in people's minds at the moment and you've just come back from there. So can you tell us about, you know, when you went over, were you there when the war started, what it's been like, how it's unfolded? So it's interesting, I noticed the Ukraine colours. Yes. <laughs> the seats, I just it was, because I've been looking at that flag so much mm -hmm. uh, in, in the last couple of months. So I saw it saw the war coming um, and went to Kyiv and then I spent about two and a half weeks there before the outbreak of war. I came home for a break and I was woken up on the morning of the invasion at six by the news desk in London saying uh, they've attacked their missile strikes on Kyiv, we need you to, to go back. And so I had made a promise that I wasn't going to stick myself under bombs and shelling anymore and so I kept to that promise and so I went instead to Lviv in western Ukraine and I said I will do, I'll cover the refugee crisis, uh, which I did and, um, which is, and which is still ongoing and it was extraordinary that first Saturday when we went down to the railway station and there were no other journalists there at the time, there were Ukrainians but no other international journalists and it was absolute chaos, absolute chaos. And I remember standing on a platform and being told, look, there's one train coming in today that's going to Poland. And I looked around me and it was thousands upon thousands of people. And so we waited and the train came in and it was all entirely predictable what would happen. There was this huge crush. There were people fighting with each other to get on board. There were women and kids being trampled. 
And I was watching this and thinking, heavens above, this is 2022. This has happened because a man in Moscow has made a decision to launch an invasion. This doesn't need to be happening. You know, there's nothing, there was nothing, you know, that made this inevitable. And this is the key point I want to make, is war is not inevitable. People always make choices about war. You make a choice to invade. You make a choice to pick up a gun and blow someone's brains out. It always comes to, to a choice that's made. And, um, and this was very clearly the case now. And I remember in the weeks leading up to the uh, invasion in Kyiv, and um, I had travelled from the, the Belarusian border down to, to Kyiv and stopped in towns along the way and talked to people. And everybody I met expected an invasion. And I was talking to other journalists in the hotel in Kyiv, and some of them were, were Russia experts saying, oh no, he, you know, this is all just about getting attention. Um, and I just had this feeling in my gut, no, this has nothing to do with attention. This is going to happen. This is absolutely going to happen. And, uh, and my view was that, uh, that Putin calculated that the world, and correctly, <laughs> Uh, if you'd seen the evidence of the, the previous decades and, and, and everything we'd been through, uh, that the world was cynical, um, that at the end of the day people would turn away and the media spotlight would move on and he'd be able to get away with it because Europe depended so much on European energy. The Americans ultimately wouldn't really want to get bogged down in a mess like this and didn't really care enough. And um, I said, that's the calculation he'll make and that's why he'll do it. Because he thinks, frankly, he'll get away with it. Um, that was the calculation he made and he did do it. But he hasn't gotten away with it. That's the, the different thing about it. The Ukrainians have fought incredibly hard. They're also being armed to the teeth by the West. They've been giving the, all of the latest intelligence that's coming from Western listening stations, from satellites. And it's now a military catastrophe for the Russians. But that won't stop it. That will not stop it. Um, Putin doesn't look at this in the way that we look at it. If it was a Western army, you, could, you know, your parliament would be screaming, your newspapers would be screaming, people would be out in the streets marching. That's not going to happen in Russia for reasons we know very well, because you'd get locked up if you do that. Um, so therefore, I, my, my expectation is that it will plough on. Uh, with many, many more deaths, but it's unwinnable. It's not winnable. And at some point there will be a, a settlement uh, when we've all really forgotten the origins of it because how quickly attention moves on. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is disquieting the way that we appear to have left Afghanistan behind, you know, because it had happened or it had mm. erupted uh, with the, the, the Taliban a very short time ago and it, mm. and it still is in a desperate state, oh, yeah. but nobody's talking about it in the West anymore. No, our, our, and, you know, I mean, Africa is a, <clears throat> the, the kind of the politics of the continent of Africa mm. and the many different countries and cultures there are very close to, to my heart. I spent most of my, my kind of career as a foreign correspondent working in Africa and you, you know, there's so many things that are going to be ignored because of this, which is tragic. Mm -hmm. And we, um, the, other, the other big question for me is, is that we get to 2022, to a crisis like this, and the fact is nobody even asked in advance, would the United Nations be able to do something about this? It's been so shoved to one side, not just by, you know, the, the unilateralism of, uh, of Russia, of course not, or indeed the Chinese. <clears throat> it's, it goes back to the Iraq war and the choices that were made then. Uh, and so the, we have an international system which is utterly broken. You know, the, the UN, it's not even a talking shop anymore. It's nothing apart from the extraordinary work done by its, its kind of um, civil servants and its volunteers and its, its staff in different war-torn parts of the world. But in terms of being a place where you could sit and avert conflict, the very thing it was brought into being, you know, after World War II to achieve, forget about it. We haven't, it hasn't been able to, and that's because of a lack of will, because of a lack of will by the permanent members of the Security Council, the big powers. That is the, the crisis we're in. And I fear a much worse conflict to come unless we resolve that 
basic issue of a broken international system. The other system which is in, in difficulty is, is the system of people welcoming refugees, isn't it? I mean, I was talking to some people from Médecins Sans Frontières recently and they were saying that they had been on the Polish border trying to help people mm. who were dying in the forests there of, of cold, you know, Syrian and mm. Afghani refugees and, 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 and African refugees, black people, brown mm. people. And then suddenly it's fine and there's a whole big very good operation to try to help uh, Ukrainian refugees to come through. So there is a very, very different sort of standard being applied there, isn't I there? I mean, there is. And, and if you look at what the European Union has tolerated in terms of illegal pushbacks of refugees mm -hmm. at sea, yes. which is, I, I spent quite a bit of last year looking into this sort of stuff, and really brutal treatment, mm -hmm. beatings of people, people being killed, um, boats, being, as turned boats back. being turned back, shots fired over boats. Um, so there is, of course, but the world is what it is. It's in a, mm -hmm. you know, and and you're in the terrible dilemma of, of saying, well, what, so what do you want? Do you want Ukrainians to be turned back mm -hmm. as well? No, what you do want is a more humane uh, policy. Uh, but again, that comes down to it's one thing blaming the EU, okay, or or even blaming national governments. People have to look into their own hearts about how many refugees and how many asylum seekers, how many migrants they're willing to have in their communities. Because, you know, politicians, yes, a lot of them manipulate, and, and particularly in parts of Eastern Europe, manipulate negative public sentiment about refugees and asylum seekers for political advantage. But it comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. It comes from a level of public hostility that people need to be honest about. Well, that's one of the things that I think you talk about a lot in this book mm. is those silences that people tend to just leave alone and uh, not want to interrogate. But um, one of the things I noticed in your intro to this book is that you mentioned that one of the reasons that you wrote it was to explore your own obsession with war. So can you talk mm. to us a bit about uh, about this book and about how how it was that your own family history drew you into the whole notion of, of exploring war? I would say I was a strange child <laughs> in the sense that, you know, I was um, from a very early age drawn to, to reading histories. I mean, how many 10 year olds are reading a biography of Bismarck? It's not healthy, you know, <laughs> it really isn't healthy. But that, sorry, that, that comes from some of the stories I was told. My father was a great storyteller um, about the revolution, about the War of Independence. Um, not about the Civil War. It also comes from the particular atmosphere I grew up in. I mean, the first school I went to was Skullvreed in Dublin. It was, um, a, a, I suppose nowadays you'd call it a Gale school, but then it was, it was very much imbued with the kind of strong nationalist sentiments of its founders. It had been founded by... Um, by people who were intimately involved with the revolution. And that was, it was 1966, it was, I, was, I think, my second year at school. Uh, and I vividly recall the, um, you know, the celebrations around that. And the notion that I had, which was particular to my family history, of course, because every other kid in the class wasn't feeling this, but that, that war was something which would make you heroic. You know, there was, there was, if, if you were going to be a hero, and I wanted to be a hero because I was growing up in a, in a quite dysfunctional alcoholic family background. And so heroism, you know, the, the, the need not to feel afraid, the need to do brave things mm -hmm. sort of got into my DNA and it was, had a huge part in me becoming a war correspondent. But at the same time as that, which is, was possibly not a, an entirely, it was a bit dysfunctional, <laughs> that kind of instinct. But as this, at the same time, I also developed this curiosity about untold stories mm -hmm. because I knew that the older I got and into my teens, that the stories my father had told me and which circulated in the family about the war against the black and tans, and it was always the black and tans they spoke about. They never spoke about the war against other Irish men and women, mm -hmm. you know, like themselves, Irish mm -hmm. Catholic men and women very often who wore the uniform of the RIC or the... The, you know, the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Um, that wasn't told. And the older I got, the more history I read, the more I started to understand the importance of interrogating the silences. 
What yeah, wasn't I, spoken about? Um, I remember hearing a talk that uh, Pat Cook gave in Belfast. He was the he ran the Kilmainham Jail Museum, and he was talking about how that building, Kilmainham Jail building, had almost had to become a ruin before it was actually possible to turn it into a, a museum because people couldn't tolerate it. And it wasn't because of what the British had done there; it was because of what the Irish had done there to other Irish people. And that's it. And I mean, I I, I talked about. You know, I, I mentioned the fact that my family didn't talk about the shooting of RIC men. Mm. We spoke a lot less about the shooting of Republicans during the Civil War. My family were very, very free state. Um, my uncles, our granduncles, were members of the Free State Army. And as you know, Kerry, North Kerry, saw some of the worst atrocities uh, of the Civil War period. Um, Bally Seedy is among the most, is about the most notorious. But there were many others. And, and, you know, the, the kind of, I won't say smaller horrors, but the more intimate ones where guys would go into a prison cell in Tralee and see a prisoner whom they knew, who'd be a neighbour, and torture him. And they weren't doing that to people who were of a different, different ethnic group uh, with whom they had a conflict or a different religion with whom they had a conflict. They were doing it to neighbours. Extraordinary bitterness and, and ferocity. Um, you also had, of course, the influence of the, the Dublin Guard, as they were known, who, who came in and uh, were primarily responsible for Bally Seedy. But it's a bit tempting to blame everything on the outsiders and the guys mm -hmm. who came down from Dublin and did the killing. No, our own people were involved in it as well. And did you meet any resistance within any elements of your family when you said that you were going to do this book? Um, there was a bit of caution, but they're well used to me by now, you know. They kind of, mm -hmm. they know, they know my... Uh, they know my style, as it were. Um, I think there was, when I started looking into issues of trauma mm -hmm. around the revolution and what people carried after, the, after that period, there, were, there was a bit more caution. Well, be, you know, you're dealing... And that, I, I don't think there's anything... I don't think that was negative. It was more about protecting the memory of people that they loved. Yeah. But I think there is a way of exploring issues around trauma which is gentle and, uh, and has empathy and is compassionate. And so I was very surprised, you know, when I went to, to talk to the relatives of one of the, the people in the book, Con Brosnan, um, who had taken part in the killing of, uh, of an RIC inspector and a district inspector, Tobias O'Sullivan, and, you know, they shot him dead uh, within sight of his family standing at their front door. That's a kind of, I mean, killing that would have been very, very familiar to you coming mm -hmm. from the north. It's the kind of thing that happened, you know, week in, week out uh, during the worst years of the Troubles. Um, but the effect that that killing had in Lestole, it was, it was a huge attention at the time, but it wasn't talked about. It simply was forgotten, not forgotten, but buried. And so I looked into this, I then looked into my own family's connections to it and to the people who'd carried out the assassination. And I was surprised, as I said, when I went to the family of Con Brosnan, uh, who, who had been one of, the, uh, one of the killers, they opened up and spoke about his mental struggles. And his grandson said to me, you know, there wasn't a day in his life where he didn't go into the church to pray for the men he killed, because he'd killed a few others as well. And that suddenly is a door opening, which wouldn't have been possible in the, you know, when I was growing up. No way would anyone have acknowledged that. And they spoke about his struggles with alcohol. And then I began to look at my own grandmother's uh, struggles, and I got access to her um, files in the, in the Department of Defence from the Revolutionary Period, and saw that she had been diagnosed with neurasthenia, which was the the kind of tell or catch-all phrase for. Uh, for shell shock or PTSD, as we would call it now. And, and I became talking then to other historians. I mean, there's a wonderful <coughs> group of, of women historians now who are exploring the whole question of trauma. I think mm. Linda Connolly, Mary McAuliffe, Margaret Ward and others. <coughs> and you realise that in that great silence which came along after the, the end of the Civil War, so many stories, so many experiences of trauma were stifled. And I worry about that. And I'm just, I'd be interested, if you don't mind, if I pop a question back at you, having 
you know, been born, brought up in the north. It's whether the same thing is going to happen again. Well, I think it has happened to an awful lot of people. Um, I had an interesting experience uh, a good while ago now where um, someone I knew in Belfast was writing a book about somebody who had been very involved in um, the IRA. And uh, I asked him if he would ask that man if he would speak to me for a, for a project that I was doing that wasn't strictly speaking about the history of the conflict. And he went and asked him and he came back to me and he said, he said, no, tell her I don't do the soft stuff. And uh, I thought, oh, I see. So that's what women do. Women, if it's a woman, it must be the soft stuff, you know. But uh, anyway, it's, that man actually, having finished doing the book with the man that I knew, uh, killed himself. And I thought, well, maybe it would have been better for you if you'd done a bit more of the soft stuff, you know, because it was obvious that he wasn't quite as, as macho and confident about what he had left behind him as, as he thought he was. I think you get a lot, there are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence in the north of people who are very damaged, but who are not willing to say so. There's an awful lot of people who, who drink constantly and who don't ever talk about anything. There's, as you know, having worked in the north yourself, there's a, there's a big macho thing up there. It doesn't do to reveal that you're weak in any way. So yeah, I think it's all, it's all sitting there waiting to explode in many people. But actually, since you've mentioned the North, I mean, was that, was that the first conflict that you covered? Was that the first place that you worked on these themes? <clears throat> it was, and um, I had a very strong sense as a young journalist in the South. I mean, I went into journalism, into local newspapers in Limerick. Actually, when I talk about covering conflict, maybe, maybe starting in Limerick was <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Back in the day. There's a clue there. <laughs> exactly. But, um, and, then, and then I moved to Dublin and I can remember really wanting to get north. Mm -hmm. I really did. And I looked around me and I couldn't understand how any self-respecting journalist in the South wouldn't want to, you know, it's 90 miles up the road from us. There's a war on. Why wouldn't you want to go and, um, and explore that and, and see why it's happening and what is happening? Anyway, so I got, I, I, um, I got a break by going north for RTE and then joined the BBC as their Ireland correspondent uh, up there. And I lived, I think, about five years in Belfast. I think the most valuable five years as a journalist and as an Irish person. I really, uh, I was really educated. Um, and I was educated through friendships. And I won't use that dreadful phrase on all sides of the community. But I was, I was educated by, through friendships with people that I would never have met had mm -hmm. I stayed in the South and who challenged my own um, preconceptions, my own understanding of history. Not my sense of belonging, because the one thing that you grew up with in the South was no argument about where you came from. Mm -hmm. Nobody was telling you, well, no, you're not Irish or no, you're not British. Nobody told me that. But I was suddenly in a place where people were having that argument mm. and being told by other people, no, 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 you're not that, you're this. And they were willing to kill for it. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you um, it is kind of one of the last challenges, isn't it? The whole thing about how we talk about con the conflict in the North in the Republic. And I'm really looking forward to that as part of the course, you know, being a Northerner who spent most of my time covering the conflict in the North, and but living in the Republic and, and coming down here mm. to sort of people who are really quite detached from it in many ways. But you actually do confront some of the big questions in this book, um, like you say, uh, um, I realised by the mid-1970s, as the death toll from shootings and bombings in the North mo moved towards the thousands, that history was, more, was a great deal more than the stories my father had told me. It lay in the untold, in the silences that surround the killings in which my own family had been involved, and in, in the civil war that had divided family member members from old comrades. But for all the new spirit of historical revisionism, we were not encouraged to ask the obvious contemporary question. What did the violence of our own past have to do with what we saw nightly on our televisions? What made the violence of my grandmother Hannah's time right and the violence of the provost wrong? Why was Michael Collins a freedom fighter and Jerry Adams a terrorist? And it strikes me that that's a question which is still very radical and very unaddressed. Mm. 
Do you think so, or do you think it is beginning to be spoken about? I think the last, I think the whole decade of centenaries has made us confront mm. Mm. Uh, the question of violence. I suppose the obvious answer to the question I pose myself, or one of the answers to it is, the period in which the violence of the Irish Revolution took place was much shorter. You know, in mm -hmm. the period of really intense, um, if we can dare to leave the 1916 rising out of it. But, you know, if you start in 1919 and come up to early 1923, it was a much shorter period. The troubles went on for 30 years. You know, 30 years. And, and, and with a, you know, a, a ripple effect in such a small place, mm -hmm. which is a, it, to this day for me impossible to describe to people who didn't live through it. So the, 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 the sort of brevity, the brevity of the campaign in the South was one thing. And, and then the other thing was that it, it is, um, to me, as a Southerner going up, I had come equipped with this sense of kind of moral superiority, which, you know, transmitted itself as smugness. <laughs> and I would say and it was quickly knocked out of you in Belfast. It was. It was. <laughs> and it was quickly knocked out of me by, by uh, Protestants and mm. by Catholics and by people who didn't identify as either in that bracing way that people have. <laughs> um, and, and, so, and then I would go back down to the South after, a, you know, a, a couple of weeks of, of covering... Um, killings and funerals and and I'd go in and I'd sit and people would either didn't care at all about what was going on or if they did spoke about the north in terms of cliches and I remember one evening being in a in a, um, a restaurant in Dublin and it had been a bloody awful week you know uh, up in the north uh, the sectarian killing and then a UDR man shot somewhere down in Fermanagh and, you know, the, the lesson I should have learned, or which I have now learned, is, is when you're with people who haven't been in the place you've just been, just shut up, don't get drawn into discussions about it. Because I was tired, um, emotional, and someone started piping up. In fact, the daughter of a prominent Fianna Fáil politician started at the table talking about how this part-time UDR man the, whose funeral I'd attended was a legitimate target. And I just thought, God, so I like, fucking let rip, <laughs> saying, um, you know, when you've gone up there, when you've gone to their funerals, then, and then I'm hearing myself ranting and realizing that how could, how could they get it if you didn't go there? Well, how could you, how could you yeah. get it if you didn't experience it? But what's going to happen now that, you know, certainly in the North, there's an enormous amount of talking going on now about the prospect of the unification of Ireland. Mm. And there's talk about a border poll and, and those kind of things. But that conversation doesn't seem to me to be happening with any degree of intensity in the Republic. And indeed, the government here seems quite nervous about talking about it at all. Yeah, wake up, lads, because <laughs> it might <laughs> suddenly arrive. Um, we, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm constantly perplexed. And also the thing is, the view you will get on that in, a, in, in Cavan or Monaghan might be very different to the one you get in Cork City. Mm -hmm. We should never ac assume a kind of monolithic southern view. There isn't. And one of the great things about this society in the last two decades anyway is the fact that it has become much more pluralistic in terms of ideas and mm -hmm. opinions and people's sense of what Irishness means. Now, does that sense of Irishness, this evolving sense of Irishness, um, evolve to the point where it sees a British dimension to accommodate Ulster Protestants within an All-Ireland framework? What, what are, would we be willing to do? What would we be willing to give in order to achieve that? But I mean, that conversation is still so far down the road, you know, in terms of being kind of publicly articulated by our political leaders, uh, even by our prominent public intellectuals, were mired in arguments in the North about the protocol, mm -hmm. about the future of the power sharing executive, which I suspect in a hundred years time, we will look back on and say, well, that, was, that stuff was detail and symptomatic of a much greater issue, mm -hmm. which is the same now as it was, but probably worse you know, 30 years ago, 
Protestant fear and how you address it? Mm -hmm. And and are there are there enough are there Protestant leaders who are willing to have the fear addressed and willing to have the conversations mm -hmm. about a you know a possible All Ireland framework? I, I don't think there are at the moment. Well, there's a there is a growing sort of trend in the north among certain sorts of, of loyalists to start mm. talking in terms of like it's time to get rid of the Good Friday Agreement. So there is a there's a big sort of trend of, of negativity and destructiveness and then going what? on at the moment. And then what? Mm. You know, what happens then? Mm -hmm. um, you've you've covered conflicts all around the world. I mean, do you do you find it wearying covering conflicts, or have you learned to? to be detached from them by this stage? I think I find it physically wearying. Um, I've worked very hard on personal detachment because I suffered greatly uh, from not doing that, mm -hmm. from being too engaged and and then carrying it home with me. And that that was that was psychologically damaging. And so a great I you know I went into um, therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder from just one war after another and going to war, re-traumatizing yourself, coming back and then... And so I did, I, I, I worked hard on on learning as best you can because, you look, you're a human being. You're confronted with this awful suffering. You're going to take some of it in. But I remember an advice given to me by um, a Rwandan genocide survivor. She's now a successful writer in France, Beata. And um, she said to me, as much as we carry all this stuff with us, you've also got to carry the good stuff, celebrate the good stuff. And it is true. I mean, I, I, I make a gratitude list mm. at the end of every day. And that helps to keep me sane because there is so much to be grateful for. And recognizing, I think this is really important. And it's important when you're standing on that platform in Lviv and tens of thousands of people are fighting to get on trains. It is important to remember that there is good in the world, that there is, you know, for every uh, Putin or every dictator or every person who picks up a gun to, to blow someone's brains out, there are people doing creative, good, decent things. Well, I think that's one of the things that's very attractive about your reporting is that you always report on loving stories as well in, in the places that you're in that you, you one of your first reports from Ukraine was of that couple who just had a baby yeah. and they were just full of joy about their baby and everybody else was looking at this war descending but they just only had eyes and you know I went back and found baby. them I went back and found them last mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. they've had to flee their home but they're still sitting there I spoke to them on zoom and they're full of uh, still full of love for their kid and that's you know that's it we are <clears throat> we're many things. We're brutal, we're mendacious, we're capable of genocide, crimes against humanity, torture. But there's so much more to the human race than that. Now, the big test of it will be, I'm going to totally change subjects for one second, um, because it's my kids who've really driven this home to me. The big test of it is, and a much bigger issue than, than it will prove a much bigger issue than Ukraine, is climate change. Mm -hmm. Because that is going to send wars of the like we have not uh, mm -hmm. witnessed so far, but I won't go down that particular. <laughs> um, you mentioned in, in this book, and it's something I completely agree with you on, is that um, in some ways poetry and music mm. are the ways to get into the heart of these things, aren't they? And obviously, you know, we, yeah. we've heard our brilliant musicians earlier and we're going to hear them again in a few minutes. But it's true, isn't it, that there are, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the people who will come along to the writing group are going to be writing poetry and yeah. fiction, as well as people researching non-fiction and history. Because poetry can get to the heart of, of what a conflict is about, can't, they? can't it? Yeah, poetry and songs, mm -hmm. they are the, 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 they're the first, they always say journalism is the first draft of history, it's not. It's the poetry and the songs that come from the people themselves. Mm -hmm. They will tell you what it felt like. I can tell you what the what I know of the facts at a particular time. I can tell you what something looked like, but I can't convey to you what it felt like to be on that platform in Lviv. I hope there's a young Ukrainian poet or songwriter who's able to do it. Yeah, and are you aware of of current people? Yeah, so one of the people. Well, one Ukraine? of the people we met actually was a woman called Rina who was fleeing with her two kids. They were aged six and four, and she's a songwriter, and she's just made it to Berlin. And um, so we're in touch with 
you know, one of the things that I was telling you this earlier when we were we were chatting, one of the things that I try and do is to keep in touch with the people I report on, to see what happens uh, in their lives. And there you, there, then you get some sense of continuity and it's a great bulwark against despair because so often I see people who've come from appalling situations and R the Rwandan genocide is a classic case in point, people who managed to, to come on and and, you know, have very productive and full lives. Yes, they struggle with trauma. But I don't ever believe we should fall for the idea that you are doomed by what you come from, if it, even if it's genocide. You know, the, 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 the most astonishing facet of human beings, in my experience, has been their resilience and their ability to change and to create new lives. And do you, do you ever find that um, people resent a foreign journalist coming in or that you've asked questions that have just hurt people or, or caused them to recoil from yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I am, um, yeah, I, particularly when I was younger, I certainly stumbled and, mm. and said things which, which undoubtedly hurt people. There was an interesting one two weeks ago in Ukraine. So I went into this coffee shop, which had been transformed into a mini clinic, teaching people how to do battlefield first aid. And I was interviewing the guy in charge of it, and he was speaking in Ukrainian. And I, at the end of the interview, I said, um, and I carried my own sort of liberal assumptions in this question when I, when I look back on it. I said to him, well, you know, you obviously, you hate what the Russian army is doing and what Putin is doing, but you don't hate ordinary Russians. And before he could answer, a guy in the corner says, what are you doing putting words into his mouth? We fucking do hate our Russians. <laughs> that's, forgive the, the French, but that's exactly what he said. And I tell you why we hate them, he said, because if you look at the opinion polls, 80% of them support what's going on. They believe the lies, they believe the propaganda. And it was one of those moments where I thought, well, you could engage in a spirited discussion here about, you know, propaganda and, uh, and police control and all of that. But it's just better to let the guy say what he wants to mm -hmm. say. So that's an example <laughs> yeah. of it, where I was taking my own, you know, well, you know, how can you possibly hate sort of stuff? And, and it was not appropriate to the moment. Yeah, I remember being very badly advised on conducting an interview with a woman who had become a government minister in Rwanda very soon after the um, slaughter there. Mm. and. Somebody had said to me, oh, ask her, uh, is it not time to start moving forward or something like that? And uh, I put this question to her and she just dragged me over to the window and said, we can still see the colour of blood in the soil outside this building and you're asking me to talk about it's time to move on. And I just felt completely ashamed yeah. about the fact that I had thought that that was an appropriate question to ask. It's a, it's, it's a difficult one and you, you do get you know, the older you get, more experienced, I hope. But you can still stumble as that, you know, occasion in, in uh, Ukraine proved. But it's also the case, isn't it, that, that, that when you're talking to people who have experienced violence, you can't make assumptions about how they're going to be, mm -hmm. you know, because we don't know ourselves how we would be if somebody that we loved had been killed in front of us or killed by somebody who was a neighbour or somebody that knew them yeah. or whatever, as is often the case in the North as in other conflicts, as you've mentioned. And if people are bitter... It's not our place as journalists to judge them, is it? Absolutely not. And I think there was a kind of a routine which you would have been very familiar mm. with, where you would, somebody would be uh, killed, um, you would go and report on the killing, then you would report on the funeral, then you would see if the family wanted to talk afterwards. And then very often a family member would give a, uh, an interview and say, I would appeal for their no revenge, mm -hmm. there'd be no revenge and I'm not bitter. And they were the people that the audiences were instinctively drawn to. But I'm not sure it reflected very often. People's trauma in the immediate aftermath reflected what they truly felt. And it was only in the loneliness, that long loneliness which follows after uh, assassinations, that people are left alone, that their real feelings, much more complicated feelings, come to the fore. Well, there was a case of that in, in a skillin up the road from here, wasn't there, when yeah. Gordon Wilson... Yeah spoke out about not judging those who had killed his daughter Mary in the Enniskillen bomb in 1987 and some of the other relatives felt 
resentful that mm. so much of the media sort of then focused in on Gordon Wilson instead of on, on the other people, some of whom were very angry and some of whom still are very angry. Mm. And they, they don't feel that they were given, they felt that there was a, a sort of notion of the ideal victim yeah. and yeah. that they didn't conform to it. And it's, you know, if you sit down with somebody and you're interviewing and, and how do you feel towards the, the people who did this, which was the kind of, you know, the eternal question. And then when somebody says, you know, I want them to burn in hell, mm. it's kind of, oh, right, okay. Um, and it was, it's just as valid a response as saying, I wish no ill on anybody, I, I want peace. People are entitled to their feelings. And it's not for us to, to kind of police, to act as moral police on what they feel. Yeah, after, after the Enniskillen bomb and Gordon Wilson, there, there came to be a fashion among journalists of asking people, do you forgive them? Yeah. Which I thought was really wrong. Yeah. Remember, yeah. It is, it's, it's kind of, it puts a pressure on someone, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and it's a very kind of religious mm -hmm. notion, forgiveness. It's, um, I remember reading Primo Levi and saying the only person who can ever forgive is the person to whom the injury was done. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is second hand. Yeah. And a lot of people feel that they would be betraying the person who was killed, mm -hmm. yeah. for example, if, if they said that they yeah. forgave the person who killed them. And what does that mean anyway, forgive? Yeah. Yes, it's a very complicated notion. <laughs> we could be here all night with it. <laughs> <laughs> so just before we, we take a, a break to hear some more music from our yeah. musicians tonight, Fergal, what would you say are the, the, the reasons why people should explore their own family history in relation to Irish conflicts? The reason you really need to go and do this course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is, exactly. Is A, because she's brilliant and, and honest and brave. And, uh, and B, because it's you, you know? And, and don't wait until, you know, God forgive me for saying this, but I spend a lot of time in the National Archives and I see a great number of people who are in their 70s and even 80s coming in uh, to, to check into their family history. But find out about it when you're much younger because you might learn things that are useful to building a better society now if you find out what happened to your own people the choices they made, why they made them, and the effects of those choices. It might stop us repeating mistakes. You know, it, it isn't the job of history to, history is the story of what happened and why. It isn't the job of history to act as a kind of political policeman now. But it sure can help you as an individual to make informed, responsible choices. It certainly has helped me when I look back at, at what my own people did. Uh, as I said, the choices they made and the justifications they made for what they did. Um, yeah, and certainly like in the North, I, I have found that there are people who are somewhat upset by the fact that nobody has ever asked them about mm. what happened to them. Um, there are people who have never been asked about how they felt about somebody that belonged to them who was killed, you know, and people feel neglected in that way as well. So sometimes it may turn out that people actually want to talk. Yeah, and you get that the hierarchy of victimhood mm -hmm. and why some particular events attract massive publicity and campaigning and others not. And um, the, the voice of every single person who lost someone matters in the, in the, the, the telling of our story on this island. I, th I think it's just particularly exciting to explore these things in the border region mm. because, you know, it's, it's, the border isn't just a line across the country, it is a whole region. It, it includes something like a quarter of the counties, you know, it, it's a big it's a place. Huge, yeah. Not the, uh... And as you say, it's a very different thing to somebody in Cork or Kerry to talk about the North than it is to somebody in Absolutely. Monaghan We're or so far Sligo away or from Leitrim. It, yeah. Although I often think, I look at the, the size of the island and and then I look at somewhere like Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. we, we think a long journey yeah. is driving from, you know, Tralee to mm -hmm. Belfast. Mm -hmm. to, oh my God almighty, the other end of the <laughs> earth. And it's nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know. Yeah, but great hatred, little, little room. Little room, named us from the start. <laughs> um, yeah. I think we'll, we'll take a, a break from talking now, Fergal. We'll be back. But um, I'd just like to bring back in... Um, Steve and Ray, and Steve, would you introduce the, the songs that you're going to do now, please? Sure, sure yeah. 
Uh, well, two compositions really. One I composed, it's a keening song. Uh, one thing musicians often get asked to do is to cry for other people, Queena, and we're keening. So it was a keening tune I wrote for a, friend, a dear friend of mine who passed away. And the second tune is um, a tune I discovered today when I knew I was coming here. To uh, it's, a, it's a song from an old, old song from a Cossack fighting in... Um, probably Crimea, and he's uh, probably 200 years ago, and he's crying for his Ukrainian girlfriend who he had to leave, and he cries to the falcon, and it's called, uh, it's called uh, Sokolai, he says, hi Sokolai, he says, hello falcon, fly over the mountains of Ukraine, go into the valleys, go into the forests, fly over the lakes and go to my sweet Ukrainian girl. We're going to tune up first, actually. For people who can't see, we're, we're sitting in a library, and it's on the back wall is a is a is a picture of Sligo's biggest war. Actually, there was about eight eight thousand people killed in a war over a book.
Thank you so much. Uh, I think you really made the case there for why music and song can can get to places that that other ways of talking about things actually can't. Po well, po I agree with you. Poetry is the thing. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a friend of mine recently just to say, uh, I was wondering, um, people like Vladimir Putin couldn't get poetry. How could you get poetry? Yeah. And yet, you know, coming from a country that has produced extraordinary mm -hmm. poetry, and right through Stalin's terror, I'm thinking of, you know, Akhmatova, um, Sertayeva, yeah, Osip Mandelstam, mm -hmm. all of these amazing poets. Um, it's, um, yeah, I think poetry demands a kind of humanity and a way of seeing things that that just doesn't allow you to to have one view of the world. What, Louis, you know, Louis, Louis McNeese said that great face, the wonder of things being various. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for that beautiful music. Beautiful, Don't yeah. worry, you, you will be hearing from Stephen Ray again before yeah. the end of the evening. But we're just going to have a short uh, questions and answers now to give you an opportunity to participate. Um, so if you want to put up your hands, and uh, we won't have time for many, very many questions, but we do have um, microphones. So if you put up your hands and we'll know how many people want to, to contribute and I'll try and get this the woman here. Hey, yeah, uh, how are you doing? Um, lovely to see the two of you. Thanks for coming to Sligo. I'm just wondering, Fargo, you mentioned about um, that you can't talk, it's difficult to talk to somebody about something when they haven't been there. So you're given the example of being out for dinner. And at the same time, as a journalist, it's the journalist's role to report on what's there. So how do you kind of reconcile those two? Or do they meet yeah. or how do they meet? Because I think when I'm, you know, when I'm with friends and my guard is down, and I suppose I, yeah, it's, it's a par part of keeping sane, in a way. So if I go to dinner, and this has become the older I've got, the more true this has become. I really don't want to talk about where I've been, what I've seen. And, um, and, I was, and, that, and particularly if it's been a very rough place that you've been to. I come out of it, um, in that case that I described, it had been a week of appalling killings uh, in the north. And um, the last thing I wanted to do was to talk about it, and then to talk about it. You know, one of the most exasperating things you can have is to have a discussion with someone whose opinions are so fixed and based on no experience whatsoever, but you know you're never going to get through it. You're never going to break through that. As a journalist, it's, it's somewhat different. I know I'm on duty. I'm there to try and report to a kind of mass of people. Each of them are individuals, and you know, when I'm broadcasting, I try to think of myself speaking to, to just one person. But it's a, it's a different dynamic to when you're in the middle of a, a group of people and someone says, hey, what about this now? What's your opinion on this? And very often you can sense in the question, actually, my opinion doesn't matter in the slightest <laughs> to them. It really isn't. It's a way of giving a speech. They want to make a speech themselves and uh, hoping that I'll agree or, you know, if not, find some way to have a go at me. And I'm just... I can't be bothered. You know, it really <laughs> exhausts me. You know. um, is there anybody else with a question? What I meant was, as a journalist, do yeah. you see? Do you think there's a way for a journalist to help the, you know, to maybe change or inform the opinions of the of of? Yeah. Or, or that, as you said, maybe that person had decided their opinion before they spoke to you. Yeah, I think. It's, it's a very good question in the context of the age in which we live, in which so many people now come to the news with their opinions already formed. Um, because it's wonderful that we have a much more democratic kind of journalism now. People can access information from any number of, uh, of sources. The problematic part of it is that they're drawn to, it's human instinct to be drawn to what you agree with. And I've always have drilled it into my kids, whatever you do, Talk to the people you disagree with. Read the stuff that challenges you. You know, read stuff that challenges you. That's fact, factually based. Ignore the nonsense, but read stuff that's that's because it's the most valuable lesson you'll teach any kid. 
is to learn to deconstruct their own arguments. Because your, your argument is worth nothing if you haven't taken it apart yourself. And too few people do that now. Um, any other questions? Yes. Just, just here in the front. Yeah. Well, no, you better use the mic, especially for the people yeah. who are watching in. Hello. Um, Fergal, you know, you're telling us about your experience in um, Ukraine recently. And I'm just fascinated by the Ukrainian people, you know, and their um, resilience. And I was just wondering, you know, have you met people like them before in, in you know, in conflict? And is there something, there's something that you find just um, extra special about them? You know, because after coming out of 2014 and, and that mm. insurrection, yeah. Um, and, you know, having a whole experience of the Molotov cocktails and, you know, going through all that and then going, going into it again now, I'm willing to go there again and, you know, stay behind and, um, you know, and fight to the death. So, you know, I just think they're extraordinary people and is there, what yeah. was, what's your experience of I meeting them on the ground? Yeah, they are extraordinary. Now, something huge has <clears throat> happened between 2014 and I covered the, the, the beginning of the war there and I've stayed covering that yeah. conflict for the last eight years. Ukraine itself has changed massively within that period. Um, it's a much more, I mean, it's still, there are big issues around corruption. Uh, there, there's a, a, around the kind of way politics is treated as the property of wealthy people. But the civil society in Ukraine is quite something else. And I was, the, the Saturday before the war happened, I was in Kyiv, sitting, having lunch, and I heard this huge cheering and crowds outside. And I walked out and there was a, thousands of people coming up the street behind this banner saying Ukrainians will resist. And I looked at the, the flags, there was full of Ukrainian flags, but there was also the, you know, nationalist far right flag group there. And there was also the LGBTQ. And the whole march had been organised by uh, Kiev Pride. You know, it was a resistance march. Now, you couldn't conceive of that happening in Russia. And that reflects the kind of societal change that's taken place. I'm not going to say that every little small town in, in Ukraine, out in the boonies, is a hotbed of pluralism and liberalism. It's not. But as a society, it has moved forward, undoubtedly. And if you look at the kind of creativity, look at the music scene there, look at the, these are always great barometers of a place. If you have thriving music scene, you have poets, you have novelists, you have filmmakers, tells you a lot about where, where a place is going. Um, and, and that's all, you know, it was a, a really inspiring place to visit. Now, I have one worry, and that is, yes, the Ukrainians are fighting to the death, but they need to be careful. I think one needs to be careful that the whole mythology of, of violence, of resistance, doesn't become an identity. Because, and you know, it's, it's when peace comes that this is, gets problematic. Militarism is something you've really, really got to avoid. You know, the best democracies are ones where the armies are kept in check. Now, given that the army is laying its life on the line day in, day out, um, and, and, you know, incredibly bravely, there's going to be a bill to be paid for that, and it won't just be financial in the aftermath, you know, in terms of trying to stabilise, if you want to stabilise a democracy there, and the military are the people who've basically saved you. The bill will have to be paid. And that sort of slightly concerns me. And, and I don't think for Europe as a whole, the exaltation of militarism is a, is a, is a wise way to go. It's absolutely necessary that they resist. Of course it is. We would do it. Um, but there's a, there's a kind of, there's a very fine line between that and uh, I won't say glorification, but the, the sort of exaltation of, of the warrior. Yeah, idea. there's something there's something there about women as well, isn't there, on the role of women? I mean, it's it's something I notice very much about the north. You know, women are north of Ireland. That is, there there are people who completely ignore the contribution that women made to holding the society together. And obviously, in Ukraine, with so many women and children leaving yeah. now, it's a it must be a very masculine environment. It is, except one of the things that that uh, is is happening, curiously enough, is the number of young women going back mm -hmm. and joining the armed forces. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and they've taken over so many of the border guard duties, for example. Now, if, if you're at the, the rail stations and you're watching the people who are stamping passports and, you know, a, a lot of young women have joined up to do that and are joining up in combat roles. You know, there's no there's no restriction on women. Um, and of course, in, in Rwanda, a lot of women did actually end up going into government and things because yeah. so many men had actually been killed. Yeah. And it's, um, I mean, it's just the... Uh, the lasting images for me are those of families separating on, mm -hmm. on railway platforms. It's just. But you do have to say to yourself, and again, it, this is how we, you know, it, it's really important how you frame things in your mind to avoid the kind of sin of despair. I'm looking at people. They're getting on a train. It will take them to Europe. In Europe, they will be welcomed. Yes, it's exile, but they will go back. Right? This isn't being cast to the four winds. And, and never able to return. That's not what's going to happen. When it's peaceful, they will return. Uh, and the country will be pumped full of um, aid and money uh, to rebuild. And so I have to say that to myself when I'm looking at these heartbreaking scenes. It isn't World War II. Right? It is not World War II, where the trains were taking you to death or to permanent exile with these mass exchanges of population that took place after 1945. That's not where we are. Um, uh, here, to, to, okay, the person at the back there and then the yeah. man on the third row here as well, okay. Hi, I just wanted to ask about, in Northern Ireland, what young people can do, because I'm from Donegal and I know, I only recently did my leave insert, I know even I would hear boys yelling up the ra in the hallway, you would see on profile pictures for school, Jerry Adams and things, and there's a lot of tension even with younger people to do with Northern Ireland. And I was wondering, what can we do about that? Because even we would go to Derry or Enniskillen quite often just for shopping, and there's still this deep feeling of tension. And I feel it a lot of the time when I'm home. So I'm wondering, what can we do to help with this? Susan. <laughs> Um, well, I, th I think it's a really, really interesting question, and I, I think the answer is to talk about it and to, to make sure that your friends are talking about it as well, because that's what we were saying earlier mm. about, you know, there still is this border thing where people in the North are talking in a different way about the future than people in the Republic are, and in some ways, it seems to me, people in the Republic are avoiding talking about the future of the island. So I think, and I think it's true that Sometimes people in the Republic are just frightened by that feeling of tension that they get in the North, so they prefer to pretend that it isn't there. But I always remember during the whole of the, the Troubles, you know, there would still be those busloads of women who would come up from the South to mm. buy cheap drink and washing powder and stuff, you know, and it was like nothing mattered except just getting, <laughs> getting the bargains. But they still weren't, they weren't going to go home and talk about what was happening in the North in terms of, of the Troubles. But I think that crossing the border and talking to people is is really, really important. And it's something that's not done enough. I've often found that it's much less likely in the border area that people from the Republic have gone north than the other way around. Northerners come south, but um, there's there's not so much traffic the other way. And uh, But I think it's brilliant that a young person like yourself is, is thinking in those mm. terms. What do you think, Purple? Absolutely. And the up the ra stuff, I mean, God spare us from that. You know, it, it's... So, I think there are two things to say about it. What has been noticeable is in the last year or so, it's much less likely that you'll get a prominent Sinn Féin person shouting that out in a pub at a mm. fundraising night. I think there's a kind of awareness now that it's not cool. But much more importantly is... The kids who shout up the ra, if they are properly educated about not just what the IRA did, but what the UVF did, what the UDA did, what British forces did, what happened in collusion, about the truth, the reality of violence, okay, what it really means, you wouldn't get that nonsense, you know, no more than you get people, you know, declaring their support for any kind of militarism, because that's what it is. You know, you're, you're, it's a blind militaristic slogan. 
Yeah, well, it's very yeah. noticeable in the north at the moment that, that some of the people from the loyalist community who are urging a return to violence are people who weren't actually around during the years of violence mm. and don't actually know how bloody awful it was. Um, the man here, Keith, uh, can you take your question, please? And then, then this woman here, and then unfortunately we'd better stop. <laughs> Thank you both. It was a wonderful discussion. Can I just ask Fergal, how is this current conflict going to end? Um, I think it will end, again, I'm, I'm so wary of predictions. Um, it won't end with the defeat of Ukraine. That's not, it's clear that's now not militarily possible. And that in itself is a massive defeat for, for Putin. However you spin this, even if he gets to keep the Donbass and, uh, and uh, that southern corridor um, and Crimea, that's not what he set out. Let's remember what the war aims were. The war aim was, and there's no doubt about this, to, to impose a puppet regime in Kyiv and to bring Ukraine back into the uh, the, the Russian sphere. Instead, what you're going to have probably is, yes, the loss of those territories and Ukraine joining the EU at some point in the next decade. It's security guaranteed um, by NATO powers. It won't be a member of NATO, but, uh, you know, any of this Putin could have had through negotiation. Um, the idea that they were ever going to be allowed into NATO was, you know, as Putin knew that that was, uh, was a non-starter. They weren't going to push that one. Um, they were going to go into the EU. It'll probably happen more quickly now. So f for those reasons, I, am, I think he will probably prolong the war and try and bleed Ukraine more and more, whatever the consequences are for his own people. Uh, if you'd asked me in 2014, did I still think there would be a conflict going on there a year later, I would have said no, it would have been resolved. Now, it's still... You know, we're still into that that awful conflict. So I am, I'm a bit pessimistic about all these peace talks that are going on. They may, you know, they, they're kind of, there's a lot of trial balloons being put up about potential solutions. I think it will be the one that I've outlined to you, but I'm not sure. And we don't know what's going to happen in Russia itself. But, but without a doubt, he made a massive miscalculation. He did not understand the Ukrainians. The Ukrainian people and how the country had changed and either his own intelligence people lied to him because they didn't want to tell him the truth or he didn't want to hear what he was told and as a consequence has walked his country into this disaster. But he was also given a lot of encouragement wasn't he by, by other governments who turned Indeed. a blind eye to Absolutely, him? Absolutely yeah but I mean it was ever thus. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, uh, we are great friends with tyrants until we're no longer great friends with them <laughs> and then they're our worst enemy in the world and the worst people in the world. Uh, there's a woman here in the third row, or the second row. I'm afraid this will have to be the last question because we're running over time. Thank you both very much for the discussion. It um, kind of carries on from your question for Fergal. Um, bit of a weird one. Um, when you, kind of, it was the beginning of your career when you were, went up north to, as opposed to the, the Troubles. In the first year or two, you, did, you talked a lot about duration of the war of independence mm. the civil war three years of three decades of the troubles in the first year or two in the north did you think it would be kind of 30 years later no i um i mean i suppose what i thought was when i finally left it was 1980 1990 when i left and went to south africa and at that point i was getting on the plane thinking there is no way on earth this thing is ending anytime soon I couldn't have conceived of sort of eight years later that you would have had a, a Good Friday Agreement. Absolutely could not have imagined that happening. Uh, and yet it did. Um, and I went to South Africa and it was, the, the difference was so striking. I mean, there was appalling violence taking place. But at the same time, you knew history was going one way. It was, there was a sense of inevitability uh, that black rule was coming. And so it happened. I had no such sense of inevitability at all. Um, about the North. Could not have imagined the peace settlement that uh, that transpired. But don't ask me where it's going now. 
Yeah, the, the, what happened in the peace process in the north was was fascinating in that everything seemed impossible and then suddenly it happened. So that can happen at the end of a war as well, can't it? That things that seem impossible suddenly come to pass. Yeah, and I'm but I'm but I'm busy looking at the kind of the current crop of politicians and wondering who are the people who are going to step out and make the big gestures that need to be made. Um, and whether they you know, whether there is going to be a constituency that supports them in doing it. And I'm not just talking about about unionism. I'm talking about nationalism and republicanism as well. Mm -hmm. what, what, how far are we willing to go to say to the Protestants on this island, in the north of this island, we want you to be part of a new Ireland and, and we're willing to change ourselves in this way to accommodate you. Okay, well, that's a good note on which to, to finish, uh, Fergal. Thank you. Um, before we move back to the musicians, I just want to ask you to, to join your hands and thank Fergal for his fascinating contribution to this. Thank you so much, Fergal, and you've raised so many questions for us, you know, that we'll, we'll be watching your coverage now with a more informed eye as, as to what you're about. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, so now we're going to get a, a last song from um, our musicians, and it's actually, I think, called The Song of Lost Things, but Steve, maybe you would introduce it again for us. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a song called The Song of Lost Things. It's based, I read a great book by... Uh, Poetic book, poetic novel by uh, a crime writer, John Connolly, and he writes terrible, gruesome crime, but he wrote one book called The Song, uh, the, the, the Book of Lost Things, and uh, this is The Song of Lost Things. And I'm joined by Ray Cohen tonight, who's singing the song for me. I got COVID last week and I can't sing. I can't sing anyway. <laughs> Remember the day we'd walk down by the river We'd catch a little trout, maybe catch another And all the while the stream goes gently tumbling by and we'd gather up the twigs as we set to light a fire And the sun up in the sky was climbing higher and higher And all the while the stream goes gently bubbling by But Rosaline, where are you? Rosaline, where are you? And then there'd be the times we'd be climbing up on the mountain Looking up at the stars and then we'd start to count them A one and a two and a three and a four and a five And on we'd go And it's many's the happy day Out walking by the ocean Sharing all our dreams All the wonderful notions The gulls laughing all the while The tide's still coming in And we danced upon the sand As we contemplated nature And the moon came out 
like a complicated creature and shone her pale light down upon us all. But Rosaline, where are you? Rosaline, where are you? Rosaline, where are you? Rosaline, where are you? So now is the open mic section, and um, well, my name is Emma Stewart. I'm from the I'm one of the students from the Sligo IT Writing and Literature course, and I'm going to uh, open the section with my piece, Why I Write. Why I Write. I send my mother, my sisters, and my best friends flowers on their birthday. Every flower, every sweet, soft, colourful petal embodies a sentiment I feel for them. In this way, they know I care for them and that I am thinking of them. I send them flowers because I can't materialise my thoughts and send them feelings wrapped in gold paper from the deepest corners of my being. Gestures speak a language of their own. In the early evening, when I sit at my desk in an old rented cottage with a galvanised roof at the foot of Ben Bulban, facing the Atlantic Ocean, I am, as always, overwhelmed with the beauty and intensity of this Irish setting. The blue of the sea, the blue of the sky, the distance of the sea that makes me want to run to it, touch it, drink it, bathe in its glory. These views grab me by my hand and move me, shake me, pull me and push me into the point where I know that this entire life is a premium, a chance, a gift, maybe even a fluke. And I have to write because I don't know what else to do. I write because I don't have the ability to float or skate across the rivers and lakes. I write because I can't dance through the clouds and touch the tip of the earth or swing through the Amazon rainforest kicking and screaming. Maybe I am too emotional, too hysterical, too histrionic. Maybe I am mad. I write because I won't live forever. Alice Turpin. Alice Turpin. Hello, thank you. Um, I also am a student of writing and literature, but I'm in second year on the online course, and this is the opening of a monologue I've written. Okay. I have this scar on my ass, on my right butt cheek. It's just outside of where my knickers and togs cover, so you can see it when I go swimming. This clean white line. I don't mind it, it's kind of neat and it's still raised a little. I quite like it. I tell people I got it from swimming in a river and crashing into a rock, which is completely true, actually. I just don't tell them that I was naked or who I was with, the doctor. It was such a clean cut. The rock must have been really sharp. I didn't even feel it at the time. The water was quite cold, even though it was summer. But when we stopped under a bridge, like two trolls, I pulled myself out and sat on a little ledge. He kind of checked me out, his eyes roving down my body, and I followed his eyes, and then there it was, this pool of bright red blood right next to my ass. I remember the colour was so vivid, the bright red against the deep green moss. It was almost trippy. It had rained a lot that day, so the river was swollen and fast, and everything around us was this luscious green, and there was this scent in the air. We'd been floating along, and I remember he whooped, and I felt so far away from it all. He said he felt like he was on mushrooms. Trying to stop under, under the bridge had been difficult, for me anyway. He stood up easily. He was so tall. But the river pulled me further, almost taking me. 
I tried to swim against it and he watched me saying, not like that. I remember looking at the gash on my ass and thinking it looked exactly like a chicken fillet that had been sliced with a sharp knife. It bled really freely. I didn't feel a thing. He examined it closely. That was his area, I guess, trauma. He seemed very concerned with the aesthetics of my ass and he advised me to go to another doctor so that they could glue it. It would leave less of a scar that way. That was the first time I remember feeling something, anger, impatience. I couldn't go to a doctor over him again. He pick me, picked up on my energy, I guess. It's fine, it'll be fine, he said. It won't get infected. The first time I went to the doctor was after our first date. I say date, we fucked in a lake. Good fun. I'd actually been to that lake before on another date, which is kind of weird. The other date, we sat under a full moon and just talked. He didn't even try to kiss me. It was lovely. He went back to Australia though, and I think he's in love, judging by the Instagram stories. Anyway, I felt a bit weird, guilty almost, having another date in the same spot, like I was tainting the memory somehow. But then he arrived, the doctor, and he was so tall. He was all smiley and confident, and it was easy to chat to him about nothing. It was wet and windy, but we went swimming anyway, in togs this time, the first date. And you know, it was fun, it was exhilarating, we were alive. We started fucking really quickly, right there in the lake. A bit too quickly, really, but you know, heat of the moment. I remember at one point I could hear people approaching, tourists, Germans, I think, and I was sure they were going to spot us. I'm not so into that, you know, getting caught, sex in public places. Anyway, we were kind of hidden, pressed up against the jetty, and thankfully the Germans turned just before we came into view. We didn't use protection, and I was slightly taken off guard by how frank he was about it afterwards. He just brought it up. Are you on the pill? I wasn't really used to that. I had thought about it, but figured I'd just sort it myself. I was going to lie to him just to save the hassle, but I couldn't. No, I said. He started googling morning after pill. We were kind of in the middle of nowhere and it was a Sunday so the pharmacies wouldn't be open. I remember thinking I liked him. He was worried about the time frame in which I could take the pill and still have it work. I knew I had lots of time, but I didn't let on. I didn't say much, actually. At one point he said, not looking up from his phone, I can't read you. I remember that. Now we have Maeve O'Hare with her poem. Hi everyone. <laughs> uh, making an orchard. One foot down, a shovel at a time, I planted an orchard during the cold March wind of 2010. River silted clay, upturned and aerated, then a bare-rooted apple tree placed and patted into soil from the lush golden vale. A gift from the Midlandian Ice Age, the climate movers of long ago. We have them to thank for soil so rich in all that's good. Early Paleozoic shale and old red sandstone, making fine loamy drift of limestone and sand. I kept shoveling and planting, shoveling and planting until 206 old Irish apple trees had found a new home in this wrinkled soil. My hands like boulders, frozen and numbed, like my mind trying to work it all out. Trying to work it all out with two small kids in a place more lukewarm than not. You were two years dead. The three of us now finding new ways in a straightened world. Apples from a bygone age grafted onto strong rootstock, so brawny against the life cycles of nature and of man. Keeping these varieties alive, part of our heritage is saved for another hundred years. Ard Karen Russet, an apple for desserts, discovered in 1890 from a garden in Cork, now here. Bally Vaughan, an apple for the cooks, discovered in County Clare, pale yellow, pink flush, now here. Dick Davies, another Cork garden, Mrs. Rawley's seed from the 1900s. Conical in shape, 
carmine in colour, now here. Gibbon's russet, with flattened apex and rounded base, this cider apple from 1802, found in Dublin, Cork and Meath, now here. Kerry Pippin, sweet and aromatic for eating and desserts, grown in many counties, now here. Kilkenny Pyramane, for tart and for cider. Orange red flush with red stippling, found in 1873, now here. Lock tree, tree found in an orchard in Wexford. Crimson stripes, downy skin, rescued forever, now here. Scarlet Crofton, a medieval find from Sligo first grown in the 1500s. Angular and scarlet, now here. Now I sit and watch them, stout against the sky, and I think you would be proud. They give organic fruit in early autumn and pink blossom in the spring. My children, like the apple trees, in love and concord, have grown up now but we'll remember the planting time of these old Irish saplings in a cold March field in 2010. Damien Kelly. I, I have a poem here as called The Mirror. Bouncing light in the opposite direction, left is right and right is left, intimidating all that see into this world, revealing lines, wrinkles and grey hairs, impacting our lives since childhood into adulthood and old age. Solidified and manufactured for all humans, what would we do without you? invading our privacy every day, but that's a price we're all willing to pay. Always reminding us of who we are, but never showing us who we were. Never using a lens or a filter, always just giving face value. And last but not least, Maria Hamill. Hi, yeah. this is a poem I wrote about my little sister who came to visit me last week. It's simply called Teresa. Sister, you visit my house in search of silence, but your arrival fills my heart with sound. Taking care of you allows a temporary motherhood to which I will forever accept. Spoil you, scold you, my lucky figurine and millions of hair bands. Steal my trinkets to have your memories. Your, co your coffee stains remain in mine. Sister, Complain, laugh and cry, I'll bear every emotion. You have seen so much in your time, I forget that you're a child. You have met loss before you've turned 14. When father fell, I wasn't ready to take the mantle. Your visit has allowed me to understand that now I am. We live in a world where, where danger surrounds us all and you simply wish to be a child. Sister, every night I kept, kept you safe is night's her treasure. You've added color to my ghostly white. I have never felt more closer to you, more far away from you. So much older, but yet so much younger. This house will never forget your presence. You have left, left your crescent mark on my walls. You hug me tight, a golden rarity. Dear sister, I would die for you, and I would live for you. I am your guardian now, but you are the angel. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the wonderful warm applause for our amazing guests. Um, it's been a fantastic first night back. A big thanks to Ray and Steve and to Fergal and to Susan. Um, I just wanted to say we're delighted you're here. If you'd want to find out about next month, it's going to be um, our former colleague and uh, all around incredible author, Louise Kennedy. 
So we're really looking forward to that the last Wednesday of, uh, of April. So you can jot down your details at the desk there and we'll let you know at the time. But one last big massive round of applause to our incredible guests. Thank you.